All right. Um, Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. All right, so in verse number two, God talks about the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and we've talked about verse two for a week or two now, and so we've kind of dealt with that. I want to draw out one last point. I'd like you to get Job 33 and Romans chapter number eight. Job 33 and Romans chapter eight. And when it says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, I want you to see there that it says, uh, the Spirit there is a capital S. It's a member of the Godhead which is in action. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is God Himself, God the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to know from, from Scripture is that I find that this is important because God has made something, but it doesn't have life. And the Holy Spirit comes down, and it comes down upon the face of the waters, and the Spirit is the giver of life. The Spirit is the giver of life. You know, there's, there's different roles for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And God the Holy Spirit here is the giver of life. And it's almost as like he's a, it, it's, it, you know, you, I, I, I envision that as a bad analogy. It's, it's totally inadequate. But I, as a hen broods over its, its eggs and its, and its chicklets, I almost see like the, the Spirit of God coming down and hovering above the waters and incubating uh, what he has created in, in preparation for life. And we have here the divine action of God himself. In Job chapter 33 and verse number 4, it says that the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty, that's the, 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 the Spirit, right? The, the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 2, it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit capital S, is life because of righteousness. The Spirit is life. It is the Spirit when God breathed into man and man became a living soul. And so there's the issue of the Spirit giving life. And so when the Spirit is moving here, I think you have something that's very substantial. In verse number three, uh, the scripture says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And so you have here uh, God creating some things here and he says let there be light and you know that you, you can there there is light without the sun right because God has a light of himself God said let there be light and there was light and then the light filled up what was in what God had made and that's what Paul calls the heaven there but there is a light that God has. It's the glory of God. And as we've talked about in the past lessons, you know, as we've talked about the container that God made and the waters that are up there, that is the veil of God, the, the darkness that veils us from the light of the glory of God. And so if, if that wasn't there, the glory of God would be what's lighting the universe. You know, in the, in the, in the new heaven and the new earth, there is no sun. Why? There's no longer a veil. The veil is gone. There doesn't need to be a sun because it is the glory of God that lights up everything. There's no more darkness. There's no more night because God is here and, and God is permeating everything. He's all in all. But my point being here is that, uh, that, that God creates a light to light up the firmament that he created because he is veiled from it. You remember we talked about the third heavens and, and the structure of that? And, and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to look at that in a little bit, uh, a little bit more when we end tonight. But um, right now it says, And God said, Let there be light. And what we have here in Genesis chapter number 1, we've been talking in manuscript evidence about the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God and the power of the Word of God. The, the power of the Word of God is on display in Genesis chapter number 1. 
Because every time God wanted to accomplish something, what did he do? And God used his hands to mold clay from the earth, or God used his hands to do something different. No, every time you see God wanting to do something, he speaks. You see, this is the power of the word of God. When God wants to accomplish something, he does it by his word. So when God wants to accomplish something in you, is it any wonder that the scripture says that it's the word of God that works effectually in you that believe? Is there any wonder that when he wants to work in you and accomplish something, it's accomplished through his word? It's no wonder. There's, there's 10 statements here in Genesis chapter 1 where God declares something. And so just as there are 10 commandments with Israel, there are 10 commandments here that God gave to creation. God said, let there be light, let there be a firmament, let there be a dry land, grass, herbs, trees, lights in the firmaments, signs and seasons, water animals and fowls, land animals, man and food. And so when God said all of these things came about as a result of, and God said, and God said, and God said. So there's power in God's word. Not only does this speak to his power, but it also speaks to his utter authority, his utter authority. I'd like you to look over at Matthew chapter number eight. When we talk about the authority of the word of God, I, al I always think of this verse because to me it's the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the epitome, uh, epitome of how we as men view the, the, the power of God's word when we realize it and, and when we come into conflict with it, or rather should I say when it comes into conflict with us. And in Matthew chapter number 8, I'd like you to look at verse number 23. Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 23. And when he, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Huh. Can you imagine being one of those apostles there that got on the ship? And it says that he rebuked the winds and the sea. Who has the authority, nature or God? There's no such thing as mother nature. There's such a thing as God's creation. God has all authority. And the winds, you know, the winds got a little upset and the water started rippling a little bit on them. And he said, peace be still. And what happened? They obeyed him. You know what I think? I don't think it was a situation where they had to wait a half an hour for things to kind of settle down. I think he spoke and it was immediate. And they marveled. And they marveled and they said, that the winds and the sea obey him. What did they obey? Was he like some enchantress doing voodoo down in, in, uh, in Haiti, you know, doing some chicken bones on the, on the sea deck of the boat and doing a little, or, or like, a, you know, a, a, you know the, the Indians would do the rain dances? Was he doing a rain dance to get the rain to stop? No, no, you see, Christ spoke. And God said, peace be still. And what happened? It was still. You see, this speaks, so I'm, I'm, what am I saying? I'm trying to get you to understand that when you look back in Genesis, maybe we take for granted that God spoke everything into existence. That's pretty incredible, is it not? Everything that we've ever done, anything that you've ever done in your life, you have done physically speaking either by your hands or your actions or something of that nature. You made a basket, playing basketball. You did that with your hands. You kicked a soccer goal. You know, 
You, you fixed a car. You made a car. What did you do? You took something that God already created and you molded it and made it into something else. God spoke and everything came into being and that speaks to his power and his authority. In Luke chapter number four, turn over to, since you're in Matthew, look at, look at Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter number four. And I was, you know, the, the, the thing that I think about is that God created all things by speaking it into existence, and we marvel at the trivial matters. You know what I mean? Like, we are, we are, we are so lacking in faith. <laughs> um, in Luke chapter number 4, it says in verse 36, uh, Luke chapter 4, let me get there. Um, I'm going to start in verse 33. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. Oh, there's, that's interesting, isn't it? The unclean spirit said, Let us, us, multiple. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? See, even the devils, even the devils know who has the authority to destroy them. Jesus of Nazareth. I know thee, who art thou? Uh, I know thee, who art who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, "Notice this is the words again. It's it's God speaking, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him.' And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed." Everybody's watching this. And they're all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they came, come out. I mean, look, I know that they rejected Christ as being their Messiah, and that he was of God, and that he was God. I understand that they rejected that. But <clears throat> I find that, you know, in our lives as well, I think we take for granted the power and authority of God, and sometimes we're amazed at the, at the little things. We read this and it's like, wow, Christ caused an unclean spirit to come out of a man. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, well, he also spoke all the dirt into existence that made the mud man in the first place that the, that the, that the evil spirit came in and indwelt. By him, all things were created. And by him, all things exist and have their being. That is the God that we serve. So we shouldn't be surprised that when he speaks that something happens. We shouldn't be surprised when he says, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes forth. We shouldn't be surprised when he comes down to meet us in the air and says, come on up, church. And then we start rising up out of this building we start going up in the sky and say, this is incredible. How did this ever happen? I know we're going to do it. I'm as guilty. I'm guilty. I'm the guiltiest. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, wow, this is incredible. I can't believe this. I, I hope those words don't come out of my mouth. I can't believe this. I'm going to be like, wow, this is incredible. How did this happen? I'm going to marvel at it. But should I? <laughs> I should already know the power of God. <laughs> if he made the firmament, and everything that exists, is it so much of a big deal that he could take this little worm and have it go through that firmament that he, that he created? Not at all. He says, let there be light. Going back to Genesis chapter number one, he says, let there be light. Go over to John chapter number eight. Or better yet, get John chapter one. Get John chapter one. In Genesis, he says, let there be light. And God said, let there be light. And I, you know, this is the, the first words of God that we have recorded in Scripture. Now, when I say that, I realize, I believe that every word in the book is the word of God. And so in the beginning, God created is the very words of God. But what I'm saying here, we have what God spoke. You know, he spoke it out loud. And it says, let there be light. 
Those are the first words of God. And God brings the light. Who is the word? And God said. That's the words of God, right? Who is the word? The word is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who brought light into the world. In John chapter number 1, it says in verse number 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Notice that light. And the light shineth in darkness. <clears throat> and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Think about that. God says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, let there be light, and there's some physical light in the world. But it says the very word of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who became flesh, Christ in eternity past was not always flesh. Christ was not always flesh. He became a man. And it says that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And he is the one that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The only reason you're not in spiritual darkness as a result of your sin is why? the light that comes from Christ. He has lighted your world. He has lighted my world. And he has given us light. And the same God that said, let there be light, and it came into the physical realm, the moment you trusted the gospel, said in you, let there be light, and there became light in your spiritual man, in your soul. In John chapter number 8, in verse number 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Light is life. Them that have the Son have life. Them that have not the Son have not life. Eternal light or eternal darkness. Those are your two options. Light or darkness. That's the reason why it's always been described as the battle of good versus evil, the battle of light versus darkness. Light gives life. The life of God gives light to men. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. The ultimate light is that of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings light into our lives. That light of the knowledge of God has appeared unto us. The light has appeared. There's the light. I see it. Do I accept it or do I reject it? Do I walk in the light? Or do I continue in darkness? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, that's a... The more I read that verse, the more I realized that's a packed verse. Because then I, okay, God commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. He did that back in Genesis, right? That's why we came to the verse. God said, let there be light. But it hath shined, that same, that light hath shined into our hearts. 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There's the face of Jesus Christ, right? The, the glory that protrudes from it. Physical light came into the world by God's word. Spiritual light comes to the sinner through the word applied by the Spirit. If you want spiritual light, it comes through the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so the light comes by the word of God and it's applied by the Spirit. Uh, Psalm says that the entrance of thy words give light. The word of God. But unfortunately, the, the world has returned to darkness. In Psalm 82, 5, it says, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. They've chosen darkness. We're the ones that have the light. <laughs> when I talk about ministering and going out into the community and sharing the gospel with people, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about showing them light because right now they are in spiritual darkness. They're in confusion. They're operating under Satan's control and under the lie program. Their minds are warped. They can't see the truth. So it's our responsibility to take that gospel to them and show them the light. We can't make them accept it but they need to see it because the world is getting darker and darker and darker. We used to live in a country where people would come into conflict with the gospel by going to the grocery store or everybody knew about going to church, but then some, everybody knew about Christ. They just chose that they didn't want to go or they didn't want to believe. It's not convenient for me, preacher. Now we live in a world where people don't even know about Christ. It's a dark world. Back in Genesis 1, it talks about when after God said, let there be light, he divided the light from the darkness. And I thought to myself, in the context of 2 Corinthians there, how there's coming a day where God will divide the light from the darkness again when he judges the world. Because those who walk in light will spend eternity with him. And those who walk in darkness will spend eternity apart from him. And they will be cast into outer darkness, not outer light but outer darkness. God says on the issue of day and night that if, they, that if people could break his covenant of the day and his covenant of night, that there should not be any day or night for their season. That while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and, and heat and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. God created it, put it into play, and it will be there. So God creates this contrast between light and darkness, and all throughout Scripture, you have this issue of light and darkness, and that we are to be bearers of light. Why slumber, you know? Don't sleep. Come out of the darkness and step into the light. You have this contrast, and we find it from the very beginning back here in the book of Genesis where God creates the, the, the light out of the darkness. Next week, we're going to look at the issue of, um, uh, of taking... Uh, I want to look at that issue of the firmament uh, one more time real quick and just lay something out for you so you see it, where you see the, the waters above the firmament and the waters under the firmament and the outer darkness. And I just want to map that out for you real quick here. I, I'm, I'm a terrible drawer. Maybe one of you can come up here and draw it for me as I as I talk, but for you to see how God has laid everything out in Genesis. I, I tried to give you an image on one of those files a little bit back uh, uh, last week or the week before, but we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Let's close for this evening. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for your word, the blessing that we get from it. We thank you, Lord, as we approach it. There's always something new to learn, and as we've seen here in Genesis, just the authority of your word. May we honor you in all that we say and all that we do, recognizing that all true authority flows from you. 
We love you and we thank you for our, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and paid for all of our sins, that we might know what this light is and that we might be partakers of it. In Christ's name, amen.